I, I want to uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, perhaps, or certainly, uh, more importantly, I want to thank our faculty for coming. Uh, without them, this would hardly be a faculty round table. Um, I want just briefly to lay out the agenda in case as you know, you're like me and you skim an email or the fire to make sure that there's a reception at the end. Uh, there is, by the way, but we're going to start off with our uh, distinguished faculty uh, giving individual presentations on a topic of their own choosing so long as it fell in the broader topic of religious liberty. Uh, after that portion is done, we'll have a Q&A session um, with you all um, participating and, and, and asking questions or commenting on what you've uh, heard from our professors. And then after that, the promised uh, reception will occur with nourishment for our bodies and perhaps nourishment for our minds as well. Uh, so I just want to let you know also that I will be uh, passing around uh, a list of quotes for Dr. Miller's presentation. But without further ado, I'd like to uh, start off with, uh, well actually if you could just, uh, let's thank our faculty first. Just. Uh, Okay, I'll start again. For a panel on religious liberty, I thought I would concentrate on probably the two most influential Christian thinkers who have ever written on religious liberty or on church-state relations more generally, John Locke and St. Augustine. And I'd like to start with Locke. What did religious liberty mean to John Locke? For Locke, my students are looking at me like I'm about to call them and ask for that question. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you what this will be. Uh, for Locke, the government has no business whatsoever telling anybody to do anybody what to do in matters of religion as such. The government should only be concerned with protecting civil interests, meaning the life, liberty, and property of all citizens. If you want to go to church and claim that this little wafer is the body of Christ, well, as long as you didn't steal the wafer from the bread factory, as long as the nonprofit organization that owns the building doesn't mind you being in there. And, and in short, as long as you're not violating anybody's civil rights, why should the government try to stop you? That's none of the government's business. Now, according to Locke, in order to protect civil interests, the government ought to ensure that we have advanced military technology, a thriving economy, and a population that is numerous and healthy. So if we're worried that our population is getting less healthy because they don't have health insurance, we can democratically pass a law requiring them to buy health insurance. What if portions of that law happen to violate some people's religious beliefs? Too bad for them, says Locke, quote, the private judgment of any person concerning a law enacted in political matters for the public good does not take away the obligation of that law, nor deserve a dispensation, close quote. That's what religious freedom means for Locke. You have the right to live under a government that is completely indifferent to religion as such, and hence you have the right not to be burdened with any laws against your religion, unless, of course, they're laws that serve the civil interests of the majority of the population, in which case, tough luck. Now, why does Locke understand religious freedom this way? What are his arguments for it? He gives about 15 different arguments for it over the course of his letter concerning toleration, but I think they all fall into one of two basic categories. On the one hand, he makes arguments based on a specific theological doctrine, which I think Locke sincerely believed, and which goes like this. God doesn't care about all these differences of religious ritual and religious dogma. The differences between Catholics and Protestants, and even I think for Locke, the differences between Christians and other religions, these differences don't matter to God. All God really wants from you is to be a good person, to live morally. What does Locke mean by living morally? Well, according to Locke's natural law in the second treatise, you have no higher obligation than your own comfortable bodily self-preservation. You have no moral obligations that would trump that right to self-preservation, nothing worth dying for, in other words. And your only obligation to others is to respect their right to comfortable self-preservation as long as they respect yours in turn. That's it. And this principle of Lockean natural law, as Locke mentions in his thoughts concerning education, is the true principle by which we all ought to regulate, quote, our religion, politics, and morality, close quote. Neither our morality nor our religion should demand anything more or less from us than to follow the gospel of comfortable self-preservation for each and all. And of course, the best way to do that in a Lockean commonwealth is to obey all the laws and to make as much money as possible, since that benefits you and keeps the economy running for everybody else. Somewhat unorthodox Christian teachings. But if, like Locke, you sincerely believe that that's all God could ask of you, then you certainly wouldn't have any problem with the Lockean understanding of religious liberty. It would follow quite logically, as he makes clear. 
On the other hand, Locke knows that many of his readers don't share his own theological views. So he says, look, even if you don't agree with me on all that, even if you do think God cares about other things, whether it's ceremonies or doctrines, or frankly anything other than comfortable self-preservation for the greatest number, you should still accept my system of religious freedom. And he gives a whole second set of arguments to explain why you should. The only problem with this second set of arguments is that every single one of them is contradicted by Locke himself somewhere else in the letter. Every one, often flagrantly. I'd be happy to give examples if you're interested. Now Locke was a very smart guy. I have trouble believing that he somehow failed to notice that he was quietly knocking down every single one of his own arguments except the ones that depended on his own theological views. So I think it's fair to surmise Locke himself believed that the only adequate arguments for his understanding of religious freedom are those that do depend on his theological views. He didn't think it really made sense for you to accept his political doctrines unless you accepted his religious doctrines. Now why wouldn't he think that? It's certainly the opposite of what most people who read him tend to think. The reason I believe is the following. Locke insists that in a well-run Lockean regime, subjects will never be tempted to revolt and in particular, they'll never revolt on religious grounds. Why won't they? He says, because they can hope for nothing better than what they already enjoy. That's an amazing statement. They can hope for nothing better than what they already enjoy. People will be happy in a lot in commonwealth. They'll be happy because their deepest desires will be satisfied, or at least as close to it as possible, because our deepest desire is for comfortable self-preservation, and the more of that we get, the harder it will be for us to put it down. And this, I believe, explains why Locke also asserts that his version of religious freedom will do a better job of spreading religious truth, as he understands it, than any other arrangement would. A Lockean commonwealth will favor the spread of Lockean theology. Because when people are truly satisfied pursuing their happiness in the ways that are made widely available by the Lockean economy of wealth creation, then people will find it harder and harder to believe in any doctrines that would require them to limit in any significant way that pursuit of this worldly happiness, as of course all non-Lockean religion does require you to do. You can see then why Locke, why Locke himself might have thought that it wouldn't actually make sense for a more orthodox Christian to fully support his understanding of religious freedom. There are lots of empty seats down here, please. It's, it's, I'm, I, it's, just because my wife, she's my wife, doesn't mean you're not allowed to sit next to her. I don't understand. <laughs> right, now, if my, if my own students are any indication, not all of you in this room are probably feeling warm and fuzzy right now exactly about the locking view of, of church-state relations. So let me turn by way of contrast to St. Augustine. Augustine, like Locke, is often misread as having argued that religion has nothing to do with politics. I don't think either of them actually thinks that. And Augustine doesn't think it for the following simple reason. Every Christian believes that God loves justice. And almost all Christians have their opinions about justice decisively shaped by the political community that they grow up in. I talked about this a bit at our panel last semester. Religion and politics are both concerned with justice, and your beliefs about one necessarily spill over into the other. Augustine would therefore certainly agree with Locke that a community built on the principle that justice requires us to treat all religions as equal, will tend to foster the belief that all religions really are equal, none any better or more true than any other. But for Augustine, all political communities necessarily inculcate some false views of justice, and hence, in effect, false views of God, all political communities. Locke thought the Lockean political community would actually inculcate the true view of justice and the true view of God. For Augustine, no such thing is possible. Christian faith, for Augustine, always requires some degree of interior rebellion against one's political community. That interior rebellion can, of course, be fully compatible with what looks from the outside like perfectly good earthly citizenship. And indeed, Augustine argues, that's exactly what it should look like in most cases, provided that the laws of a given earthly city are not too hostile to the demands of the faith. Augustine, you could say, negotiated a kind of truce between the earthly city and the heavenly city. I would therefore suggest that the best case for religious freedom today is our need or hope to maintain that Augustinian truce for as long as possible. Because that truce, as Augustine argued memorably and at length 
as the American founders, at least on the whole, were convinced, and as Benedict XVI has powerfully argued in our own day, that truce is beneficial above all to the political community, which loses something invaluable when it passes laws that prevent religious groups from fully participating in civic life. And let me therefore close with just one of those arguments from Benedict, which really deserve a whole talk of their own. Again and again, throughout his papacy, Benedict would ask, is it really true that the modern world has made us all happy as it has promised to? Is it really true that in these Lockean regimes that are so good at securing our comfortable self-preservation, we can hope for nothing better than what we already enjoy? Do our skyrocketing suicide rates, our disintegrating families, our broken homes, fraying social and communal ties, and crippling addictions to alcohol, antidepressants, prescription drugs, illegal drugs, pornography, and God knows how many other self-destructive behaviors really tell us that we're all doing just fine. If the answer is no, if Lockean politics is no more a cure for the restless heart than Lockean religion, then perhaps non-Lockean religion deserves a greater place in our public life than Locke would care to grant it. In order to take up this task of being the leaven in our modern society, the church certainly has to be prepared for the martyrdom that Locke seems to have expected would eventually go out of fashion. But the state would do well to put off the necessity of any such martyrdom for as long as possible by defending a perhaps more expansive understanding of religious freedom. My talk is on uh, the founders and I, what I call the remarkable consensus uh, of the American founders on religious liberty. And um, I'm grateful uh, to Professor Burns for his talk because it, it provides uh, a nice sort of introduction to what, um, to what I think the founders generally had to say about individual religious liberty. Um, as Dr. Burns suggested, I, I, and I think, I think it's right, I haven't looked at the letter on toleration in a while, that for Locke, the argument for religious liberty rests on the irrelevance of religion, irrelevance of religion to the end of civil society, and irrelevance to, um, irrelevance to, to God's will. And he doesn't care where you go to church, or if you go to church. Um, I don't think that's really um, how the founders phrased it. In fact, I'm fairly certain the founders themselves had a very different understanding. And it's an understanding that is um, remarkable in the degree to which it is, uh, seems to be held across the um, across the colonies and across the political spectrum. Uh, to give one instant example, one piece of bit of evidence for this consensus, during the debates over uh, the proposed constitution, when anti-federalists like Federal Farmer argued that we need to secure religious liberty, Federal Farmer said, in, in, a, in what would be a statement against interest or a statement against his own argument, that we don't really have anything to worry about right now because we don't really disagree about free exercise of religion. Um, it's a statement against this argument, of course, because Federal Farmer would have reason to raise suspicions and raise fears, but he simply concedes that everyone kind of believes in religious freedom, or he calls free exercise of religion. And, and what, what did they believe uh, about this? Well, in the state constitutions, we see a remarkably consistent pattern um, from Massachusetts to North Carolina of the following formula. Every human being, all human beings, have a right to worship God according to the dictates of their own consciences. Um, that particular formula, worship God, dictates of conscience, etc., presupposes several principles. Namely, there's a God to be worshipped. How he is to be worshipped is to be discerned through the conscience. And the conscience itself is an authority, gives commands, dictates. Um, the conscience, according to one scholar I read years ago, and I don't remember where I found <laughs> where, who it is anymore, but it's the subjective understanding of the objective will of God. Um, where did the founders get this idea from? Why is it that in North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, up and down the colonies, they're using this formula? Well, the short answer is I don't know. Um, there are various sources that seem to be likely suspects. During the period of the Restoration in England, um, in which you had uh, the Stuart Kings, who were um, famously or somewhat infamously tolerant of religious dissenters, 
there were several uh, colonies founded, Rhode Island and Pennsylvania in particular, in which from the beginning, um, the Rhode Island colony and the Pennsylvania colony, William Penn, sought to engage in what Charles, Charles I called a lively experiment in religious liberty, and what William Penn called a holy experiment. And part of Penn, in Penn's colony, in 1682, he passed an act for freedom of conscience, which um, elaborated that the, every individual had, had a duty and right to worship God according to his conscience. Um, another source of this comes from um, the Whig uh, publication, The Independent Whig, Thomas Gordon in England, I found in 1720, he spoke about the dictates of conscience as opposed to the dictates of priests. Everyone should have to be able to worship God according to the dictates of conscience. The, the expression dictates of conscience outside the, you know, the political religious liberty is, has, has an extensive um, and complicated um, genealogy. But as for, insofar as it, it affected the founders' understanding of what government ought or ought not to do as a principle of justice, um, it, it probably has a combination of colonial sources um, English 18th century sources, and more broadly um, derives from a certain wing of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, more uh, remotely, of course, it derives from Pauline Christian anthropology. That um, an anthropology set forth in Romans, indicating that the conscience in some sense is a source of authority, and at least in some passages in Romans, you, um, you can conclude from those that Paul says that the erroneous conscience imposes duties, and therefore the erroneous conscience has rights. Um, incidentally, this, this concept, dictates of conscience, finds its way into uh, 20th century uh, teachings of the magisterium. Uh, Pope John XXIII, Pachamon Terra, speaks of the right to worship God according to the dictates of conscience, and Somewhat comparable statements are made in um, Dignitatis Humanae. But those weren't the first Catholics to say that. Here in the United States, uh, Bishop John Carroll, the first bishop of the United States, said in a letter in 1783, thanks to the genuine spirit of Christianity, we have religious toleration in the United States. So he was suggesting that true Christianity required religious, at least religious tolerance, if not religious liberty. The the difference between the founders' understanding, repeated explana explanations, and what we have today can be illustrated by a public, a public, um, public service announcement I saw about 12 years ago. And it was, it was a, what is liberty? And it had various actors stating, this is what liberty means to me. And one of the actors was someone who was an, surely an actor playing an orthodox priest. And he said, liberty means to me the right to worship the God that I choose, with the emphasis on the I. I can't imagine any Orthodox priest saying, <laughs> what does liberty mean to me? Going to the store and picking out a God and deciding this is the one I'm going to worship for the day. The, the founder's formula was obviously very different, that you, you have a right to do what you have a duty to do. And relative to Locke then, the foundation of religious liberty is not the irrelevance of religion to public life. After all, the founders said, and the uh, founders said in the Northwest Ordinance and other places, that religion is necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind. Uh, nor that they didn't think there was anything true religion, because plainly they relied upon a Pauline Christian, Christian anthropology in setting forth religious freedom. But rather, they simply believed that God was greater than man, and God's will was discerned by the individual and was binding on him through a conscience, even an erroneous conscience. Where did the founders disagree? Where did their consensus break down? Well, given that the founders typically said that every individual, and they never, they, they never restricted this to just Christians, every human being by nature had a right to worship God according to the case of conscience. And secondly, that religion was a, was a good thing and should be promoted. The two big areas of dispute concern what we would today call, or they call, uh, laws respecting an establishment of religion. One of them is the use of public funds to promote religious teaching. Um, the Massachusetts Constitution, in its, first, in its second section, says every human being has a right to worship God according to the dictates of his conscience. But the section, section three of that same Constitution says that religion is necessary for good society, 
uh, for civil society, and therefore every the legislature shall order each township or local government to establish a Protestant public teacher of piety and religion, or morality and religion. For some founders, this would be for perfectly consistent principles. Massachusetts Supreme Court said, your tax dollars are not your conscience. Stop crying about it. Others said, even to force a man indirectly to pay one penny for religious practice that is not his own, contrary to his conscience, is a violation of the sacred rights of conscience. James Madison made this argument. Um, others made this argument. A second issue in dispute was the propriety of religious tests for public offices. In William Penn's Act for Establishing Relig Act for Religious uh, Freedom, he both insisted that every theist had a right to worship God, according to the dictates of his conscience, but secondly, that political office could only be held by individuals who believed in the divine inspiration of the Old as well as the New Testament. The Pennsylvania Constitution of 1776 said the same. Are these two principles reconcilable? Again, to the anti, um, to the disestablishmentarians, um, to the disestablishmentarians, this was these were not this was still a punishment. This was still a restriction on conscience to impair an individual's uh, power to hold office. It wasn't burning him at the stake, but it was still an infringement on the sacred rights of conscience. For others, uh, the sense was true religious freedom is best safeguarded by those who have the religion that teaches religious freedom and all of the other foundations of liberty. And so you see this in the Pennsylvania Constitution, at least in 1776. But the general tendency, as you know, in American history, in the, in the late founding era and early national period into the 19th century, was for the disestablishmentarians to win and the anti-disestablishmentarians to lose. Nonetheless, despite this difference of opinion on the, among the founders, um, virtually every particular uh, principal participant in the American founding, I can't think of anyone, anyone who, who disagreed, believed that every individual had a right to worship God according to, the, according to the dictates of his own understanding of conscience. And the vast majority of them, perhaps Jefferson privately and, and others, um, a, a few others of the, the less, less pious of the founders, would, would not be too favorable to this dictates of conscience formula. It is the formula that um, is nearly universal in every public and formal declaration of religious liberty, at least in the state constitutions. Thank you very much. the reunification of church and state, the progressive embrace of the German idea of a state. That the 2010 Affordable Care Act represents a massive governmental intrusion in individual freedom is well known. Among other things, the Affordable Care Act, one, so heavily regulates health insurance and the companies that sell it, that these businesses now appear to be some sort of public utility. Two, the Affordable Care Act imposes an individual mandate, that is, it requires all Americans, on penalty of a fine that grows increasingly larger over time, to purchase health insurance coverage, including certain specified benefits. The government specifies which benefits it needs to include. And three, it imposes a mandate upon all employers with 50 or more employees to provide a prescribed package of health care benefits for all full-time employees. This is the so-called employer mandate. This mandate requires all covered employers to provide their employees with coverage including contraception, sterilization, and abortion-inducing drugs. Employers who fail to comply with this requirement must pay $2,000 for every employee lacking coverage beyond the first 30 employees. The employer mandate has, quite obviously, proven to be rather controversial, especially in view of the Health and Human Services final rules for implementing the mandate. The rules show very little concern for employers who object to obeying the mandate on grounds of conscience, the rules do exempt churches from the requirement, but not nonprofit religious employers, like hospitals, schools, or universities, like UD, nor religious business owners, like, for example, the owner of Hobby Lobby. 
Now, despite the fact that this legislation represents a massive intrusion into the very rights that the founders following John Locke were so anxious to secure for Americans, it is nonetheless tempting to argue, as Yuval Levine does, that this legislation is best understood as Lockeanism, or indeed modern thought, come of age. In a 2012 article entitled Putting Health in Perspective, Levin argues that modern thinkers, in turning away from virtue as the proper end or aim of political life, quote, have put the avoidance of pain and the prevention of death at the forefront of our public life, end quote. For Thomas Hobbes, he writes, quote, relief from the constant threat of death was the primary purpose of politics and in some sense of life itself, end quote. For John Locke, in turn, quote, the most basic law of nature which must be given force by the state is that no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, and possessions. So America, following Hobbes and Locke accordingly, has defined the primary functions of political life in terms of securing preservation and the protection of life and health, in terms of securing, in other words, comfortable self-preservation. It is no wonder then Levin concludes that America has adopted a piece of legislation, the Affordable Care Act, which, given its anticipated and very high cost, threatens to make health and provision of, of access to health care overwhelm every other national priority. If you take a look at its future uh, projected effect on the budget, that's true. Now, for those who know the text to which Levin refers, his explanation of the deeper origins of the Affordable Care Act seems eminently plausible. It is all the more plausible to the extent to which one knows nothing of the actual and indeed far more paradoxical path by which the United States has incrementally moved toward the establishment of compulsory national health insurance. Explaining that path and noting its implications for the individual's right to conscience especially is the aim of my talk tonight. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, a progressive economist by the name of Richard T. Ely and an, a group that he organized called the American Association for Labor Legislation. In 1905, the American Economic Association, the AEA, a professional group organized by the American students of the German Historical School of Economics, spawned an advocacy group called the American Association for Labor Legislation, the AALL. The German-trained progressive economist Richard T. Ely was not only the lead founder of the American Economic Association, but also became the first president of the AALL, the American Association for Labor Legislation. Ely's former student and then colleague at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, John R. Commons, was selected to be the AALL's first executive secretary. In 1909, another Elian Common student, a man by the name of John B. Andrews, was named the Executive Secretary of the AALL, a post he retained until his death and the organization's demise in 1943. From the very beginning of the AALL's existence, as the historian Daniel Rogers points out, its advisory board was, quote, stocked with German-trained progressive economists, end quote. Now, it is important to rehearse the AALL's genealogy because, as one commentator uh, rightly observes, the AALL, quote, began campaigning for workers' compensation laws in 1909 and launched the American movement for unemployment and health insurance several years later. Now, for Richard T. Ely, the AALL was a vehicle for carrying into effect what he calls a new conception of the state. As he and his fellow reformers understood it, this new conception of the state, what they sometimes refer to as the German idea of the state, represented not only the restoration of a teleologically ordered and hence all-encompassing political association, a la classical philosophy, but also represented the reunification of church and state, albeit, as we shall see, on very unorthodox grounds. To the extent to which this theoretical transformation of the state was actually carried into practice, moreover, it portended a rising conflict between the state and those backward individuals who continue to think of their duty to God as a matter of private conscience. Now, before we turn to this new conception of the state, and in what way exactly it portends a reunification of church and state, it might be useful to revisit the immediate theoretical cause for the American separation of church and state. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Locke, as we've already heard, heard a little bit about Locke, but uh, I'm going to turn quickly to a discussion of the progressive conception of the state. It is well known that Locke, in his second treatise of government, limits the legislative power of government to securing property, understood as the lives, liberties, and estates of its members. For Locke, this limitation on the legislative power of government sharply distinguishes or separates the end of government from that of a church. Locke makes this implication clear in his letter on toleration, 
In his letter, Locke notes that the magistrate is limited to securing man's civil goods, that is, his life, liberty, bodily health, and possession of outward things, such as lands, money, furniture, and the like. The whole power of civil government, says Locke, is concerned only with men's civil goods, is confined to the care of the things of this world, and has nothing whatever to do with the world to come. Now, I think actually Locke qualifies that a little bit in, in what follows, but the basic distinction he draws largely remains. Government, in contrast to the church, does not seek to direct its members toward the salvation of their souls, but rather simply to secure its members' rights, including their right to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. In so distinguishing the end of government from that of the church, in short, Locke not only establishes a separation of church and state, but also establishes a hierarchy in which the church is the association that is ordered towards man's highest concerns. For Richard T. Ely, in contrast, this division of church and state represents little more than a transient phase or stage of development in the evolution of the state. The state, as Ely explains, follows a certain order of development. And uh, if you have the handout, uh, I think the first quote I have from Ely's Social Law of Service. Ely writes, this is Ely in 1896, by the way, Aristotle said the state was formed for the sake of life, but that it was continued for the sake of the good life. Its first purpose was the provision of material resources for the nourishment of animal life. But the higher, nobler purpose of the state is not the material life, but the soul and mind of man. As soon as the means of life are provided, we must aspire to the good life. The ignoble doctrine that the state is a necessary evil was as far from Aristotle as it has been from all great political thinkers. So the state, Ely explains, follows a certain path of growth or an order of development. It comes into existence for the sake of life, to provide, that is, material resources for the nourishment of animal life. If the state did not progress beyond this aim, if, in other words, this aim marked the state's terminal or final stage of development, church and state would retain very different ends. But, as Ely continues, the state progresses to a higher stage of development. For once the means of life were provided, the state should, and in Ely's view ultimately would, turn its attention to the soul and mind of man. In this highest phase of development, in short, the state would strive to promote what Ely and other progressives call the ethical ideal. To promote that is uh, what he defines as the most perfect development of all human faculties in each individual, including the higher faculties, faculties of love, of knowledge, of aesthetic perception, and the like. So for Ely and the other progressives, this change in the aim of the state would accomplish two important things. In other words, when the state attains its highest stage of development, takes uh, as its highest aim uh, kind of the comprehensive human good, including the most perfect development of our higher faculties. Um, uh, when the state uh, this, when the state takes uh, achieves this higher stage of development, it would accomplish two important things. Uh, first, when the take, state takes as its aim the promotion quote of the end and purpose of human existence. Uh, end quote, or in other words, the good life, the comprehensive character of the political association, a la the Aristotelian polis, would be restored. The new conception of the state, in other words, restores the idea that political life comprehends or encompasses all human things. Thus, as Ely clarifies, the only limit to the functions of the state is that laid down by Aristotle. The general principle cannot be stated better than he stated it. It is the duty of the state to do whatever is in its power to promote the good life. Okay? So when the state achieves its highest stage of development, the progressives understood Ely and Dewey, um, among others, understood the state to be, the political association to be restoring the comprehensive character of the classical polis. Second, when the state attains its highest stage of development and seeks to promote the end and purpose of human existence, the good life or the ethical ideal, the separation of church and state would effectively collapse. Okay, so here I've got uh, the quote from John Dewey on the, the handout. So this is an early essay by John Dewey called The Ethics of Democracy. So this is Dewey in his uh, full-blown neo hegelian phase. And he writes, Democracy in the one, the ultimate ethical ideal of humanity, are to my mind synonyms. The idea of democracy, the ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity represent a society in which the distinction between the spiritual and the secular has ceased. And as in Greek theory, as in the Christian theory of the kingdom of God, the church and state, the divine and human organization of society are one. This is striking. When the state takes as its aim the one, the ultimate ethical ideal of humanity, says Dewey, the distinction between the spiritual and the secular would cease. Then as in Greek theory, as also in the Christian theory of the kingdom of God, church and state, the divine and human organization 
would become one. Healy, as I've already suggested, agrees with this. And that same piece in which he uh, looks to Aristotle to give us the proper understanding of the order of development uh, characteristic of the state, um, he ex explains this. He says, when the, when the state reaches its developmental zenith and takes as its aim the promotion of the, quote, soul and mind of man, its purpose, says Ely, becomes, quote, religious in nature. Okay, and so I meant to bring in a quote. I don't think you have this one, but he writes, it is true that the main purpose of the state is the religious purpose. Religious laws are the only laws which ought to be enacted. But what are religious laws? Yes, excellent question. <laughs> Certainly not laws establishing any particular sectarian views or any theological tenets. Pretty interesting religious laws. But laws designed to promote the good life. Factory acts, educational laws, Laws for the establishment of parks and the playgrounds for children. Laws securing honest administration of justice. Laws rendering the courts accessible to the poor as well as the rich. All these are religious laws in the truest sense of the word. In an advanced stage, then, stage of development, the state will enact religious laws. and achieves its highest purpose, it will enact religious laws. Such laws, says Ely, will have nothing to do with, quote, any particular sectarian views or theological tenets, but will rather be ordered towards the soul and the mind of man, understood now in a fully secular way. So the state will carry out its religious purpose by establishing the very kind of reforms for which Ely and the American Association for Labor Legislation long fought. Factory acts, labor legislation, educational laws, and indeed social insurance, including compulsory health insurance. When the state attained its truly religious purpose, it would take, as Ely says, first place among God's instrumentalities, and the church would assume, at best, a subordinate position. Its peculiar province, one might think, would be to cultivate an understanding of those sectarian views or theological tenets, which would now fall outside of the state's true religious purpose. But Ely calls into question whether those views and tenets should be cultivated at all. And so I think you have this quote on the handout. He writes, It has been held by some Protestants, like the Lutheran rock, that the state in idea is the church, and that when the perfect state comes, it will be the church. This doctrine cannot be elaborated in this place, but it may be asked what need there is of a separate institution for righteousness when the whole of social and individual life and all institutions are permeated with Christian spirit. Christian spirit understood in terms of enacting religious laws of the kind we just, that I just described. We are told indeed that there shall be no temple in the New Jerusalem. In the end, Ely understands that the realization of the perfect state still lies in the distant future. But to the extent to which the state in America approaches its perfection, which is, of course, what he and his fellow reformers were struggling valiantly to achieve, um, it will claim greater control over the lives of its members and will cause greater conflict with the churches, which understand, which understand their end in terms other than the religious purpose of the state. So as Ely forecast in 1896, and I think you have this last quote, Church and state are much alike in their nature and purposes, and it is because they are so much alike that there has been so much conflict between them, conflict of which we shall hear more in the United States in future years in the past. To that extent, at least, Ely was exactly right. Thank you. Hi, everybody. All right. Um, I'm going to be talking on the contemporary status of religious liberty around the world. So my, uh, my content is not particularly philosophical, um, but hopefully it will be informative. So, because uh, as I think probably a number of you might know, the um, religious persecution of various kinds has been increasing over the last few years. Um, the causes of that are complex. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But before talking about that, I wanted to give just a brief overview of the way that religious liberty is actually embodied in international law, since that's something a lot of people don't know that much about. Um, and then I'll talk about some facts and some trends. And I'm going to be re relying primarily on two reports from 2002, um, one of them called Rising Tide of Restrictions on Religion, which was published by the Pew Forum. Uh, actually in 2000, yeah, 2012, 
and it uh, it actually aggregates a lot of data from a lot of different sources. So it's kind of you know it's, it's a major sort of compilation of information that a lot of people have been relying upon since it came out. And then the other thing that I, that I relied on is the U.S. State Department's 2012 International Religious Freedom Report. And since I imagine that the NSA is listening, uh, I, I, I would like to send a brief message to John Kerry. Um, because <laughs> when I was doing research for this, I went to the State Department website and I discovered that the current slogan of the U.S. State Department, my students have heard my chagrin at this, um, is diplomacy in action. Now, <laughs> diplomacy <laughs> is a form of activity, so by definition it can only exist in action. It's like a, if a restaurant had the slogan, cooking in action. <laughs> or a football, you know, like the, or if, if, I don't know, like the, the Rangers were like, baseball in action. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. I mean, I don't even know what the alternative would be, like diplomacy in potential. <laughs> so, if you're listening, John Kerry, um, tear down that slogan. Okay. <laughs> I have to make Dr. Burns groan at least once, and yeah. time it's just public. Uh, and so far, my streak so is perfect. So good. Yeah. Okay. So, religious liberty and international law. Uh, so, religious liberty first um, was internationally declared to be a human right uh, in Article 18 of the United Nations 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I'm sure a lot of you've heard of that. Um, the language there in Article 18 reads as follows. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Right, so if, if you want to know how religious liberty is defined for purposes of international law, that forms the basis for the definition. But, as I'm sure some of you might know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights does not actually have the status of international law. It was passed by the UN General Assembly, and resolutions of the UN General Assembly do not have the force of international law because they have not been directly consented to by sovereign states. Right, so it's not a treaty, it's just a resolution or a declaration. But, you know, to paraphrase Lincoln, they merely declared the right in the hopes that the enforcement would come soon thereafter. Um, and it did. Um, religious liberty formally enters into international law proper with the UN's International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which went into effect in 1976. It was adopted by the General Assembly in 65, I believe. And I think the U.S. finally um, ratified it, I believe, in the 80s, the mid-80s. Um, and so it also, in Article 18, defines religious liberty, mostly in the language that I had just read before, but it also goes on to add a few things to, to specify. It says, no one shall be subject to coercion, which would impair his freedom to have or to adopt a religion or belief of his choice. So that's added on there to a specific prohibition of coercion. Um, and then it says, freedom to manifest one's religion or beliefs may be subject only to such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary to protect public safety, order, health, or morals, or the fundamental rights and freedoms of others. Okay, that sounds fairly lock-in, although there are a number of countries that formally say that they honor religious liberty, but they'll put in a kind of clause that says something like religious liberty as regulated by law, which basically <coughs> is sort of like it gives you the hole through which you can just pull out everything that it seemed like you'd just put in. Um, so, but then the last thing, and this is interestingly added, it says the states parties to the present covenant undertake to have respect for the liberty of parents and when applicable legal guardians to ensure the religious and moral education of their children in conformity with their own convictions. So that's actually international law. Um, and as I said, this is properly international law because uh, it has been ratified by sovereign states, not merely declared by the General Assembly. But of course, as a treaty, it is only in force among signatory countries. And not all countries have formally adopted it. Um, so, for example, China signed it, but never ratified it. So China technically is not bound by the treaty. Um, other examples of this would be the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, Qatar, Oman, uh, and Burma. Um, oh, these are all ones that have either signed and not ratified or have neither signed nor ratified. And I should also note that Iran signed and I believe also ratified it, but in, at the time before the revolution. Um, 
So now also just one other thing, in 1981 the General Assembly also passed a declaration on the elimination of all forms of intolerance and of discrimination based on religion or belief. And it actually goes into quite a lot of detail about sort of what activities should fall under the, the sort of the definition of religious liberty. So it's much more specific, but it has not moved past the, the declaration stage. There is no treaty for this, so again it does not have um, a, uh, a, any formal status as international law. Um, and but one of the things that also eventually came out of that is that the UN Human Rights Council now appoints a special rapporteur on freedom of religion or belief. Um, and uh, the current one, as I'm sure you all already know, uh, is the distinguished German jurist, philosopher, and Catholic theologian, Heiner Bielefeld. You know, I know you're thinking, if I hear that guy mentioned again today, it will lose my mind, and they're always talking about him. Uh, but uh, his, his job uh, is to engage in fact-finding missions, uh, to identify problem areas, and to propose solutions to the General Assembly. And he can also write official letters um, containing allegations of human rights abuses. So in a certain sense, he has a formal right to say Jacques to any country in the world. Um, so in some, religious liberty is about as firmly enshrined in international law as any other human right is. But of course, as Israeli Foreign Minister Abba Iban once said, international law is the law which the wicked do not obey and the righteous do not enforce. Um, and that, that may be a bit overstated, but as we shall see, the fact that religious liberty is an almost universally recognized right um, does not mean it is universally respected. So at this point, I'll talk a little bit about the status of religious liberty today. And I can't, I don't want to throw a lot of stacks at you and information, um, so I, I'm going to try to stick to just some main points. Um, but so generally speaking, both Pew and also the State Department tend to assess religious um, persecution or religious restriction, um, and hence the, the hindering of religious liberty um, along two different dimensions. The first dimension uh, is that of government or governmental restrictions, right? So this refers to various ways that governments themselves restrict the expression or practice of religious beliefs. And this can take several forms. There are basically 20 different indicators, and many of those indicators have sub-indicators that they use to assess the various ways that governments can interfere with religious liberty. Um, and so it, this can include things such as failure to declare the right to religious liberty in the constitution or basic law of the country, um, or the making of certain religions illegal, uh, or allowing them to practice but only once they're officially registered. Um, it can mean gov governmental interference in religious worship, prohibition of public preaching, missionary work, conversion, etc. And so, for example, 20% of the world's countries today possess governments that at one or more level limit the ability of a person to convert from one religion to another. Right? Apostasy, as it is defined in some countries, carries a death penalty. For example, in Iran or Saudi Arabia, you can be killed for converting. Um, so that would be one a very, a very egregious example of governmental interference in religious liberty. Another measure uh, is whether, for example, the government holds accountable private parties that violate the religious liberty of fellow citizens. Because a lot of times sectarian violence will occur, for example, oftentimes in northern India, so Hindu on Muslim or Hindu on Christian, and the authorities just stand by and they don't do anything about it, and they don't hold anyone accountable, and thereby they create a climate of impunity um, that leads to greater uh, violations. So those are ways that sort of the government um, can be seen as restricting religious liberty. As I said, you can look at the Pew Report and there's a methodological appendix that gives you the questionnaire that they use. I know you guys are, would much rather be reading methodological appendices right now than most of talk. So I know you're ready to jump out of your seat and go read it, because you can. Um, <laughs> but the, the, other, the other assessment, or the other dimension of um, religious restrictions they assess is usually referred to as social hostilities. So these are not directly uh, perpetrated by the government, but these are forms of um, basically uh, hostile activities engaged in by individuals or organizations, private organizations, or social groups. And so this can include things like hate crimes, vandalism, harassment, mob violence, communal violence, religiously motivated terrorism, the use or threat of violence to limit proselytizing, to force people to adhere to religious codes, such as codes of dress, um, and also to prevent conversions. Right? And so obviously the gravity of the kinds of restrictions here can vary quite a bit, from murder to just lawsuits or, you know, like angry words, right? So I mean, there's a big, they, they cast a very wide net for defining religious restrictions. So just to give you a kind of sense of the measurements, um, the, the U.S. currently is, has, it scores as moderate 
not low, but moderate in social hostilities and in governmental uh, interference. So their standards are pretty stringent. So including things like if somebody is in prison um, and uh, then uh, declares he gets converted to a religion that requires him to grow a beard, um, if the prison authorities do not let him grow a beard at that point, then, that, then they'll count that as a governmental restriction on religious practice. But at any rate. Um, so according, the interesting thing is that according to the Pew Report, 75% of the world's population, as of 2010, lives in countries where governments, social groups, or individuals restrict people's ability to freely practice their faith. 75% of the world's population, right? In a bit more detail, 37% of the world's countries have a high or very high level of overall restrictions but it is these 37% of countries that hold 75% of the world's population because you're talking about India and China, right, especially, and a number of other ones. It's a nice chart in the methodological appendix. Uh, <laughs> um, and this is 5% higher than in 2009 and 7% higher than in 2007. So, so restrictions have been on the rise around the world. And this increase is made up of several factors, right? There's an increase in hate crimes around the world, increased governmental interference. You know, some examples in Switzerland, you might know they banned the building of minarets. Um, in Indonesia, Islamists in collusion with local officials have forced the closing of two dozen churches. And Christian Muslim violence in Nigeria has been increasing recently, partly the provocations of Boko Haram. Um, and this is not even mentioning the problems in the Middle East, such as the persecution of Coptic Christians in Egypt and so forth. And there's also been increasing harassment of particular groups. Um, so uh, Jews, Christians, and Buddhists, for example, all sort of in the aggregate have experienced higher levels of uh, religious restrictions uh, over the last few years. Um, and so, so, for example, the number of governments that have very high rates as when it comes to restricting religious liberty, went from 10 in 2007 to 18 as of 2010. All right, so it's almost doubled in number. So who joined the list? Afghanistan, Syria, Russia, Yemen, and Algeria. And they joined the stalwarts of Saudi Arabia, Iran, Burma, China, and Egypt, who, among others, are constants on this list. And meanwhile, the number of countries with very high social hostilities went from 10 in 2007 to 15 in 2010. So stalwarts already existing on this list were Iraq, Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, Indonesia, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. And joining them were Nigeria, Yemen, again, Egypt, again, Russia, again, and the Palestinian territories. And I should mention, by the way, they don't even measure North Korea. North Korea might, <laughs> might be the worst one, but it's impossible, right, to gather data. Millions of people, who knows? I mean, that's just the, I mean North Korea is, is, I mean, it's off the charts. So, um, now, one of, the, but one of the things that's interesting to note about the way that religious restrictions work around the world is that the, the two measures, governmental restrictions and social hostilities, don't go hand in hand. Um, sometimes they do. So, for example, Saudi Arabia has very high levels of governmental restriction and high levels of social hostility, as do, does, to a lesser extent, India. Um, but then, on the other side, you have China, where there is a very high level of governmental restriction, but very low levels of social hostility. So the government cares much more about these religious groups than does the population. Right? So you don't hear a lot about sectarian violence in China. And that's partly because the, the restrictions of religious groups in China are, are politically motivated. Uh, it has to do with um, the government's understanding of what constitutes a threat to the Communist Party and therefore a threat to social stability, um, as we'll see. You know. so, um, so in China, for example, the governmental restrictions are aimed primarily at Christians, Muslim Uyghurs in Xinjiang province, and Buddhist Tibetan. And so you can see there are kind of geopolitical considerations, partly that are guiding these religious restrictions. It's not religious animus as such whereas there are very few social hostilities. Um, so uh, there, this is, I'm not going to talk about any more numbers, but one thing I thought I would do to kind of finish up in the last few minutes, I, think I, I haven't been talking too long, um, is but there, one of the things that's interesting about the State Department's role in assessing these things is that uh, in 1998, Congress passed the International Religious Freedom Act, which mandated that the State Department publish annual reports on the status of religious liberty in every country in the world is a massive source of data, right? They have a report for every country. Um, 
And, uh, and one of the things that Congress requires the State Department to do in compiling these reports is at the end of compiling those reports, they, they must designate what are called countries of particular concern. So in other words, the countries that seem to be the worst violators of religious liberty. And, um, and so one of the things that's very helpful is, you know, you can look to that list as a kind of shorthand for figuring out the places that are the major problem spots of religious persecution. And so, for example, the, you probably wouldn't have guessed this, but the number one country of particular concern is Burma right now. Uh, Burma has been on the list since 1999, the first year that the State Department compiled one of these lists. Um, Burma is, of course, officially Buddhist um, and restricts the practice on most other religions. But then also, it, lately, the government has been complicit in increasing sectarian violence in the country. Maybe some of you have heard of this, where um, as, as mobs of angry Buddhists have been attacking Muslim population with a tacit or over support of local officials. See, I knew some people laughed. It's like I just said, mobs of emaciated sumo wrestlers, you know, or, or mobs of enormous jockeys, right? You know, it's like a contradiction in terms to have angry Buddhists. But there is massive persecution of Muslim minorities in Burma. Um, number two, of course, is China, um, because they, you know, they restrict any religious group or really any group within civil society at all that they see as a threat to the, uh, to the control by the Communist Party. Um, but especially Buddhists in Tibet and Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang, because those are kind of uh, provinces that they're trying to hold on to and eventually move more Han Chinese into to displace the, the native population. Um, and so they engage in crackdowns, uh, you know, the killing, arbitrary detention, torture, and organ harvesting, which is a, a, a major human rights abuse that goes on in Xinjiang province every day, where people are basically arrested on various pretexts. Uh, and then their blood type is taken to see what kind of matches they can make and then they're executed and, and sometimes vivisected before they're even dead to get the organs to the various party apparatchiks and cronies and mistresses thereof who need organ transplants. Um, so that's, that's uh, part of the way they do politics in China. Um, now, some other ones on the list are Eritrea, Iran, of course, officially theocracy, North Korea, they put on the list because obviously bad things are happening there. Saudi Arabia, although we waive sanctions against them, technically we're supposed to have sanctions against everybody on this list, but we waive sanctions against Saudi Arabia, uh, Sudan and Uzbekistan, right? And China and Saudi Arabia, by the way, are both currently on the Human Rights Council at the UN. So it's kind of a strange situation. So I'll just end with kind of one sort of general observation, um, which is that although the worst offenders on that list are what we would consider authoritarian governments, it's also clearly not the case that democracy itself is necessarily the answer to these problems. Give people more democracy, you'll have more religious liberty, because India is a clear example that that's not the case. Um, India is a long-standing democracy that has very high levels of both governmental restriction and social hostility on, on sectarian grounds. So the ultimate problem in many of these places, as James Madison would have told us, is really majority faction, where you have a majority group, you know, that basically abusing the rights of religious minorities. And the, the uh, imposition or the adoption of democratic governing structures um, just creates a state apparatus in the hands of that majority faction, either at the local or, or, or at the higher up level. Um, and so that's why, for example, if you look at like sort of a four by four graph where you see social hostilities and governmental restrictions, you find countries with low levels of social hostility but high government restriction, like China. But you never find a society where there's high social hostility but low governmental restriction. Almost anywhere where there's high social hostility, the government is kind of in on the act. So democracy as such, obviously, is not going to be the answer. But of course, the causes are not uniform, right? This is partly authoritarian governments cracking down on minority religious groups for political reasons, and it's partly sectarian groups motivated by religious hatred uh, attacking um, religious minorities. So there's no one-size-fits-all solution, but that's kind of the picture of the status of religious liberty today. Thank you. First, I, I would like to uh, thank uh, both George Alacusin and Maureen Benopstel for organizing and uh, advertising uh, this event as they've uh, done before. Um, 
this is a, a really great opportunity for us. Um, indeed, I, 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 sitting here uh, listening to my colleagues, uh, I couldn't help but think what a pleasure it is to belong to a department that takes these issues seriously uh, and, can, and can articulate uh, very clearly and thoughtfully uh, their views. It, it really is remarkable. And uh, uh, in fact, though, uh, uh, Paul, uh, Dr. D'Alvarez uh, always reminded me, though, that the real thanks we have to give is to our students, uh, who would actually themselves take such issues seriously and enroll in classes that we think they should take. <laughs> so thank you. Well, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, okay, let me jump into what I, uh, I want to talk about. Um, the, the, uh, there, of course, has been significant public discussion uh, over the past few years concerning the question of religious liberty, um, but the question of protecting religious freedom is indeed a question as old as the church itself. And what I'd like to talk about tonight is uh, to focus on a bit on the historical question of the freedom of the church, in particular in its infancy, and then reflect, reflect a bit on the historical situation in the United States and how we got to where we are today. In the early centuries of the church, so first the early uh, experience, in the early centuries of the church, there was little question, of course, of anyone seeking beneficial support from the state, given the Roman Empire's hostility to Christianity. This led some early Christian writers to reject the very existence of the state and to hold it to be entirely illegitimate, comparing indeed its authority to that of the Antichrist. This was an understandable position to take, especially given the persecution the church was routinely undergoing. Others, though, taking their cue in part from scriptural injunctions to obey the powers that be uh, and that all power comes from God, recognized the legitimate power exercised by the state and were willing to obey its commands provided that they did not conflict with the teaching of the church. Thus they often, for example, willingly served in the Roman military, though they refused to worship the emperor as a god, as was sometimes necessary. In the 4th century, though, following the Edict of Milan and the recognition of the legitimacy of the Church within the Empire by Constantine, just as matters looked as if they were improving for Christians in regard to the authority of the state, new problems arose. Constantine, setting the stage for the actions of many subsequent emperors, began to see himself as playing a significant role in the operation and teaching of the Church. For example, at the Council of Nicaea, he noted that others had been appointed bishops by, quote, by God for the internal affairs of the church. I, on the other hand, have been designated bishop for external affairs. It's a problem. <laughs> Constantine also saw the usefulness of the church for his own purposes. And so he looked to it as a way of providing a point of unity in the empire that he had not been able successfully to instill himself. But seeing the church as a useful body, rather than as a divinely ordained institution possessing and promulgating the truth, led Constantine to try to avoid questions of orthodoxy, which he considered useless trivialities. The consequence was that for him, if Arianism would prove to be a better tool for unity in the, in the empire, then he would promote it and suppress orthodox teaching. As, a, as we've seen, actually, it's a favorite practice of despots. To keep matters brief, subsequent centuries proved combustible in the attempts in fits and starts to settle the relationship between the church and civil authority. The end result finally was a split between the Eastern and Western Empire in which Eastern political power continued to exercise significant influence over the Byzantine church, but the Western church under the leadership of Rome was able to assert and maintain its independence. Importantly, uh, I will add, one of the great champions of the Church's independence in the West was popular sentiment. The last, uh, as example of this, the last Eastern Emperor to visit the West, Constans, uh, in his attempt to regain control over the papacy in the Church, was killed in the year 668 in Sicily. I love the Sicilians. <laughs> okay, let me turn though to, to America. Uh, jump over some things that you can talk about later. We used to say uh, that there were things that every schoolboy knew. One of those things they knew, or were told, or we were told that they knew, 
is that America was founded on the principle of religious liberty. Now, there is some truth to that. But there's more truth, perhaps, in the argument that America was populated by European colonists not for the sake of promoting the toleration of other religions or other Christian denominations even, but in order to be free to practice their own religion, often, sometimes, to the exclusion of other religions or religious denominations. Yet the American founding era did produce an expansive defense of greater religious liberty, uh, certainly at the national level. While this clearly did not put an end, I'd suggest, to all prejudice against Catholics, it did provide a more level playing field for pursuing important endeavors that would allow Catholicism to grow and indeed flourish in many ways. And here let me cite uh, Pope Leo XIII. In his encyclical letter, Longinqua, published in 1895, said this about the success of the American project. That your republic is progressing and developing by giant strides is patent to all. And this holds good in religious matters also. For even as your cities have made a marvelous increase in wealth and power, so do we behold the church from scant and slender beginnings grown with rapidity to be great and exceedingly flourishing. And he goes on to talk about two things. One is the growth of religious institutions, uh, schools, uh, 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 hospitals, etc., but also uh, the growth of monasteries, convents, and the promotion of spiritual interests uh, in America. And, then, and, he's, and he says this then, what, so what caused that to, to come about? Well, he says the main factor must have been uh, the, the teaching of the church in America. But then he says this also, thanks are due to the equity of the laws which obtain in America and to the customs of the well-ordered republic. For the church amongst you, unopposed by the constitution and government of your nation, fettered by no hostile legislation, protected against violence by the common laws and the impartiality of the tribunals, is free to live and act without hindrance. This recognition of the, that's the end of the quote from the cyclical. Uh, this recognition of the healthy condition of the church is tempered, though, by his subsequent comments. Uh, and here, uh, I'll, I'll skip over them except to say his concern uh, is that uh, Americans are too, might be too promoting, uh, too interested in promoting act activity, active virtue, rather than contemplation. Uh, and he has a special concern, especially about uh, the question of divorce and the uh, relatively easy access uh, to divorce. Still, I think one could say the historical evidence suggests that the Constitution and the consequent laws as ratified and enforced for the first 150 years or so of the country's existence were not simply or fundamentally deleterious to the rights and liberties of Catholics. Consider, for example, that under the Constitution and laws of the United States, the Catholic Church in America established two of the largest and most successful institutional arrangements in the history of the world, the Catholic school system and Catholic health care systems in America. Catholics in America created and funded the largest private relief organization in the world, Catholic Relief Services, and founded and populated the largest missionary effort in the world, so that by 1970, over 8,000 American priests, brothers, and nuns were at work in foreign missions. Now, it's also true that many of the success stories of these Catholic institutions in America were, in part, the result of hostility toward Catholics, a hostility that did still exist in various sectors of American society, including in schools and other public institutions. As for an example, close to home, uh, since we're at a Catholic university, for many decades, Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society refused to allow cha uh, chapters uh, at Catholic institutions because uh, they didn't think this was real education. <laughs> but the law and order, I'd suggest, that existed within society allowed Catholics who desired to do so to found their own schools, their own medical systems, uh, their own businesses, and thus to follow their own principles in action. But what Catholics face today is a circumstance far different from that which our predecessors faced in a number of ways. One manifestation of this changed circumstance can be found in considering the way in which anti-Catholicism has appeared throughout American history. 
In decades, or even centuries past, that animus against Catholics was most often driven by the view that Catholics were foreigners, that they had an allegiance to a foreign power, the Vatican, and that they could not be trusted to support the American cause. This can be seen in the activities of groups mostly originating in the 19th century, like the Freemasons, the American Protective Association, the Know Nothings, and the Klan. Over time, though, as Philip Jenkins, among others, has shown, hostility towards Catholic has shifted, such that it's now largely characterized by the view that Catholics hold on to positions that contemporary American elites have repudiated, though they once held them and even held them tenaciously. In other words, Catholics are largely now seen as a part of the old guard in America, thus holding unreconstructed and uneducated views of public policy matters that we have moved beyond in the progress of time or that we should move beyond. An example of this, I would suggest, can be seen in the recent debates about marriage or the opposition of, uh, or the opponents uh, of the Catholic or natural law understanding of marriage uh, who want to liken opposition to the new understanding as akin to promoting Jim Crow laws, for example or you are opposed to science if you are squeamish about fetal stem cell research. In company with that phenomenon of the new rationale for expressing contempt for Catholicism, today we face a battery of institutions and agencies, most of them in the service of the federal government, which assert authority over numerous aspects of our lives that would have been unheard of in earlier generations. The result of the massive increase in the size and scope of the federal government has meant that virtually no activity one engages in in society is untouched by the rules and regulations handed down by the government class. To be frank, though, we have to acknowledge that at least part of the growth of the authority of the government, and thus the limitations on religious believers to act according to the tenets of their religion, is because we have too readily allowed it to occur. Indeed, in many instances, we have positively welcomed it. Uh, often because we want to enjoy the benefits that come with the government's involvement in the programs we have wanted supported. For example, many of the recent disputes about providing health care benefits, whether the ongoing question of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, uh, I, I understand that's now, uh, it's no longer Obamacare, uh, since, since the failure of the website, uh, we've gone back to referring to it as the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so the provisions there in the form of, of contraceptive and abortion coverage or the earlier versions of the debate, which involves state law requirements for things like contraceptive coverage uh, involving various Catholic uh, charities entities. So a good part of the difficulty there uh, arose in such cases, in these cases, the Catholic charities cases, for example, uh, that had to do with the fact that Catholic charities is, was governed by regulations that apply to any entity accepting public funding. Catholic Charities, as it turns out, annually receives somewhere between, I can't get the exact number, somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of its budget from public sources. It's small wonder, then, that the programs that Catholic Charities wishes to continue operating will be subject to greater and broader regulations from outside influences. When you accept the funding, the regulation invariably comes in its wake. But one might very well ask, why accept the funding? In part, the answer to that question can be found in recognizing the fact that the church no longer can afford to manage schools and hospitals and other entities, in part because of the virtual disappearance of teaching and medical orders within the church. The resulting lay-run and eventually secularized programs have thus become much more expensive to maintain and also have, in many instances, lost their close attachment to their Catholic identity. Too often, then, uh, uh, many times, though many times doing important work, uh, they come to look like auxiliary organizations to the state or federal government. And one last point then. Uh, there is an additional point to be made here related specifically to the question of religious freedom. Much of the concern expressed by the Catholic Bishops Conference over the past four years now in regard to the Affordable Care Act and the subsequent health and human services mandates regarding coverage for contraception, abortion, etc., could have been easily avoided, as was foreseen by the, at the time of the passage of the law in 2010 and in 20, 2009. One or two key votes at various times would have defeated the bill, but they were not forthcoming. 
in part because there was significant support for the bill from so many, even in the Catholic community. The thought at the time, of course, was that exceptions to some of the subsequent mandates of the bill could be carved out, the so-called Stupak Amendment idea, and we could all live with the consequences. As it turns out, that's not likely the case. Once such a bill is passed, and as one prominent Catholic politician put it, we can find out what is in the bill, there is in fact little likelihood that interested parties are going to be able to provide protection for their own concerns within the operation of the law. That simply is not how the law works today. In so many other areas, including schools and medical facilities, the same pattern has developed. The state expands in size and scope, the Catholic Church shrinks in its public dimension, yet wishes to provide programs and services which it cannot fund itself, and so it must turn to the state as the source of its sustenance. But the state is not an indifferent entity, and those who control its levers of power often possess fixed notions of what ought to be accomplished by the state and its agents, and will not countenance views and actions contrary to that agenda. The modern state may, in its graciousness, grant a modicum of freedom to its subjects, but there's no assurance that in fact it will do that, even for those who are presumably its friends and allies. Thank you. By Augustinian truce, I meant that that uh, I meant what Augustine lays out in chapter 17 of Book 19, the City of God. That the the he says the citizens of the heavenly city and the citizens of the earthly city had been uh, at, at war for for hundreds of years because the, the one was persecuting the other for their for, for its belief. Um, and he he I said he sort of brokers this truce where he says you know you you guys don't make any laws that infringe too badly on um, on our religious. Um, our ability to practice our religion, and in exchange, we obey your laws, since they aim at earthly peace, and the heavenly city recognizes that as a as a genuine good uh, while we're in this pilgrimage. That's I think that's a, that's all I meant to say. Uh, Dr. Cobb, if I understood you correctly, you said that intolerance of many nations is on an absolute from 2007 to 2010 or 11. Yes. Is there any reason we know for that increase, or? Uh, are you talking specifically about it, sort of the aggregates of both governmental means and social hostilities? Is that what you're asking? Yes, sir. Do you have yeah. an understanding of why they increase resources? Yeah, I mean there there are a number of uh, I mean there are a number of reasons. I mean, partly it has to do with um, in some places the Arab Spring and the after effects of the Arab Spring, um, for example, in Egypt and places like that, where you, you have these shifts in government, where uh, unfortunately a lot of Christian minorities in the Middle East receive relative protection um, from the uh, dictators or the autocrats that, uh, that run those countries. So there's been, that, you know, there's been a certain amount of unleashing of social hostility that, that uh, also in places such as Egypt um, has the collusion of, uh, you know, the, uh, the government. And in fact, for example, in Egypt, um, it, it used to be that there were um, restrictions, there were certain restrictions on religion, but they were made at the level of statutory law. So in principle, the parliament could change them, could liberalize things. But there, but for example, uh, laws against de defaming, um, or uh, anything that's usually put it, defaming the prophets and messengers of God, 
that is now constitutionally prohibited in Egypt under the new constitution. So that's the kind of thing that counts as an increase because then it's, it's the, the supreme law. Um, so I mean, those are some of, those are some of the reasons. Um, you know, uh, in some places these things just happen. I mean, same thing in Burma with the kind of with the weakening of the military regime and the movement towards more openness that has emboldened. Um, you know, the sectarian violence, and the government is not necessarily against it because they officially promote terribly Buddhism. They don't really care about uh, the freedom of minorities there. Um, and there are, there are various other reasons. In Russia, it has been cracking down on you know, dissidents and civil society more generally. Does that, so there's not, it's kind of, it, it, it varies to a certain extent in the country. The air spring, the pretext provided by the war on terror, um, uh, increases in religious terrorism itself. Um, and then, uh, to a certain extent, democratization. Those are all causes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Miller, you, uh, when you were discussing Locke and Locke's understanding of the purpose of the state as opposed to the purpose of the church, uh, the way you sketched it out was that the state exists to secure the life, liberty, property, etc., of the citizens, uh, and the church uh, exists for the, the kind of concern for the salvation of. Uh, and then I, I believe you said that uh, so so the state is concerned with lower concerns and the church is concerned with higher concerns. And, uh, salvation for law is is man's highest good. Uh, I was wondering if you could expand on that because the way that Dr. Burns and Dr. Upham spoke about law it sounded a little bit like uh, comfortable self-preservation was uh, if if not man's highest concern then. Uh, most politically relevant concern. Um, and so I, I just wanted to say a little bit more about uh, salvation for Bach. I mean, it seems to me, um, if you look at the second treatise, okay, so um, Locke very clearly defines the legislative power in terms of securing property, lives, liberty, and states. Um, he's silent uh, about um, man's higher concerns there. Um, so I think happiness is uh, given me a mention maybe three times, um, and there's no uh, real discussion of, of salvation there. Uh, the letter of toleration, letter on toleration, it seems to me presents something of a contrast where he does explicitly uh, suggest that man has um, a soul and a body, and that uh, the body and uh, the goods of the body are really the proper concern of the magistrate. Um, and that uh, man does have a concern for uh, his eternal life. And so uh, the soul in the sense of, of salvation, that is the proper aim of the church. I think Locke in, in the letter on toleration is kind of uh, ultimately, he draws um, a more clean division of labor than I think if you read it carefully, he suggests not that the uh, um, magistrate should have no concern, um, but especially can't use compulsion to promote um, a, a path towards salvation. Um, so that uh, in terms of, of political matters, yes, I, I don't know that there's a great deal of difference uh, between Dr. Burns and I on that particular point, that, we, that that Locke does define the end of government largely in terms of securing, um, uh, you know, what he calls the letter of toleration and man's civil goods. Um, and that, uh, uh, that it's, it is if he is going to, to seek out a path towards salvation, that is something he voluntarily chooses to do. Yeah, Dr. Darman, um, it seems like the religious liberty statement would be uh, in, in, in modern politics, to, to say the very least. Do you, do you see a path back to the kind of truths that Dr. Uh, Burns set up uh, from Augustine? Uh, any any real indication that we have a fighting chance if you're if we're interested in restoring some sort of a healthy uh, laid down of arms between uh, religion and government that we could actually see a way that this might happen because that seemed like the carve out some solution even if some Catholics were uh, deluded into thinking that was the, was the case. What 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 do we do now? I guess. Take <laughs> <laughs> <Hate> politics class. <laughs> Yeah, I, well, I, I guess what, what I, uh, one of the things that I, that I left off uh, uh, saying, because I talk, spoke too long already, was um, that uh, I'd say one, one um, limitation, I think, on the, the contemporary debate, from the point of view of, of believers, 
is, yeah, it, it's that, you know, if you could just get that little bit for yourself, well, that's not the way it works. It's not the way the law works. It's not the way the state works today. You know, you, you, you have to reform the state if, if you're going to do that. It, it, there's no reason, there's no principled reason why you should be allowed that car vote, right? And now the difficulty is, and I, well, but I, I think one problem with the argument that, that believers often make is they jump right to the question of belief. Right? That is, rather than trying to make a, a natural law, rational argument, and say, okay, here's where we might in fact find some degree of uh, compatibility or sympathy with a larger society, it's, an, it's immediately, you know, run to, to the corner to the argument that only a few of us are actually going to accept. And it's the truth, sure. Yeah. But we're, how far are you going to get with that? Um, so I, I think engaging in that, that uh, in, in the argument in the public realm is, is really the way to do it, and, and not and not to be uh, afraid that uh, you, you've lost already. Uh, that, because if you think that you've lost, and you're, you're going to keep losing. Uh, now, will it be successful? Well, better than not trying. No, no, but it, but it will be successful. But, uh, but I, I, that is a, you know, I, 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 you, you just see this all the time, you know, it's, it's uh, well, you know, I should be able to, to do my thing over here. And one consequence of that I would suggest is, you know, what, what we've seen over the last few years uh, is the argument that uh, you often, we've often seen this, the argument being made that, you know, what the First Amendment means is freedom of worship. Right? Not free exercise of religion. So, you know, we'll defend your freedom of worship. What that means is, Stay in your church. If you want to do those things in your church, that's fine. You want to bring them in the public realm, no, you're not, you're not going to be allowed to do that. So do, you, do you think that the winning argument more than is convincing everybody else that they have just as much to lose by uh, Catholic organizations being forced to provide something like uh, contraceptives or abortion care? Meaning, meaning, like, should we try to convince people that, yeah, it's us now, it's you next? Because it seems like there's a lot of groups that already believe this, the, the Hobby Lobby case. This is, this is Christianity in general, it's being offended at this. I wonder how much stronger the argument can be made. It seems like... It seems yeah, like sure. It's no, I and mean, as a practical matter, as a practical matter, yeah, I mean, it may be that this, you know, here's one way to do it, either in the legal realm or, or in the, in the uh, 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 public realm more broadly, but it, again, it's a, you're, you're making it, you're making it, you're narrowing your argument, you're narrowing your audience. I think the religious liberty for Locke is not a right distinct from any other rights. So that's what I've tried to argue. It's you have the right to live in a government that doesn't care about religion as such. That's, that's, that leads to a, a religious liberty in many cases. Um, and it's in particular religious worship is, I think he does this explicitly in the letter. It's not on the rights of property. If, you wanna, if you've got your goats and you want to sacrifice one to Zeus, they're your goats. Who's to tell you not? Unless there's a goat shortage and we have to make a law saying you're not allowed to kill goats and then you're not allowed to sacrifice the goat to Zeus. Um, so I, I don't, I, I mean, religious liberty, it's, in a way you could say it's epiphenomenal in Locke. I mean, it's, it's a real thing, but it only exists as a function of, of the rights that he, that he lays out in the second treatise, the rights to life, liberty, and property. Thing. And, and therefore the right, for example, um, well, you, I mean, you can't, you can't be restricted from um, preaching the existence of the Trinity, for example, because you're not harming anybody's life, liberty, or property by doing so. So you know, even, even freedom of speech is not, a, it's not in the, the state of nature, but it, it, it's, a, it's a logical consequence of the type of government that's formed out of the state of nature. I think I would largely agree with that, um, because if you look at the second of Judas, he doesn't deal with it, uh, where, where he's talking about natural rights, um, or man's natural freedom, and certainly he is identifying specific ones. Um, he would have perhaps expected to be there, but he doesn't address it there. Um, but he deals with, it seems to me, man's natural freedom in so expansive a way, um, and that there appear to be, I mean, he offers various arguments for uh, kind of a foundation for that freedom um, that, uh, you know, he defines it in places as man's perfect freedom. I mean, it's the absence of natural rulers, and so that suggests that 
so long as you are not violating the life right of another, uh, you are free to govern your own actions. Um, and so that it becomes the purpose of government to put you in the enjoyment of that freedom, or at least as much of that freedom as is consistent with the public good. Now you mentioned the public good in your talk in terms of uh, in a letter uh, that denies that you have a right to be exempt from legitimate laws. Um, and that, I, th I think that's right. Uh, I would also point out that how expansive we the public good is understood becomes a very important consideration in terms of how expansive the freedom is of that right as well as any other. So in other words, law in, in the second treatise defines the public good in terms of preservation. So in other words, you try to define it in a very minimal way, and that kind of reduces conflict. Um, one, of, one of the implications of the progressive definition of the state is the public good becomes synonymous with the human good. And so the, that's why I think Ely is forecasting you're going to see rising conflict. I just wanted to, to add something about that. I think, I, I think the American um, tradition on religious freedom uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries um, it's different from Locke in this respect because of the, uh, among other various um, considerations, the, the constant use of the phrase civil and religious liberty. As if these are just distinct categories, um, the, the way religious liberty is, is, um, is treated, given the sort of primacy of place in the state constitutions, and, the, and, and, and finally, the, the, the extremism, I don't think it's a bad thing, but the extremism manifested in this fear of even taxpayer subsidized religion. Um, even uh, any kind of government, you know, government uh, preference for one religion over another, as opposed to government preference for one economic, you know, um, preference for manufacturing, or, you know, for example, Hamilton. Um, so there's this, it's, it's given a different place. And, and in the same regard, tie in with what uh, Professor Culp was saying, you mentioned 1976 civil and political charter for civil and political liberties, which doesn't, which doesn't speak of religious liberty as a separate right in that way. And the way I probably call you to find it, it's, um, it's consonant with, with the way religious liberty is often spoken by of, of, of some kind of progressives today. And that is, it's, it's really not a separate right, it's just a, another, it's another manifestation of autonomy. It's the liberty of the mind to think what you want. And even the way you, the way it was you know, discussed, but the manifestation, the public, it, it's all just one big freedom of expression, as opposed to, uh, so it's a liberty of mind and expression, which does tend to marginalize religious, religious exercise for its own sake, other than just simply a, you know, it's kind of like a big demonstration. Every, uh, going to church is a demonstration of, of an expression of the autonomous, uh, the autonomous mind. So I, I, I think the early American period had a, um, had a way of distinguishing religious liberty from, from, the, from some of the other liberties um, that is less present in Locke, and I think um, religious liberty gets swallowed up in what's left of individual free autonomy in the mind in the, in, the, in the progressive state. Let me just add in response, because I think this is one point I'm not sure whether, I, whether we agreed on or not, because we, I agree that we agreed on all the things you said, but those, the two, two things are just in response to your question, John. One of them is that because religious liberty is not uh, a right distinct from any other rights, you can't claim religious liberty as a right against laws that actually benefit the comfortable self-preservation of the majority. So there's no, you can't say, sure, it's good for the, the comfortable self-preservation of the majority, but what about my religious liberty? No, no, com religious liberty only exists as an, as an outgrowth of that, and so it's not something you can wave around against it, for a lot, at least. And secondly, uh, the, um, I mean, the comfortable self-preservation of the majority, I'm not sure whether we agree on um, how expansive a government is required for that. I mean, for Locke, Anything he says related, anything related to arms, riches, and a multitude of citizens, a multitude of course including health, and that, 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 that seems to me like quite a bit. And so he says, for example, the magistrate, uh, if the magistrate understand the washing of an infant to be profitable to the curing or preventing of any disease that children are subject to, and esteem the matter weighty enough to be taken care of by a law, he may order it to be done. I, I don't know. Do we agree on that? Uh, then, <laughs> house answer? Are, yeah. are you suggesting then that, that uh, that's an opening to everything? Well, no, but it's an, it seems to me an opening. He's saying the government can command healthcare. <laughs> healthcare in the form in which we understand that today. I mean, um, so. Well, I'm not saying he would like Obamacare, by the way. That's, that's <laughs> very. That's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> access or 
routine health care, chronic health care, preventative. Um, I mean, look, it seems to me at some point that's intention. Look, and I, I think this is true. Um, Locke is identifying uh, 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 the propriety of the legislative power setting down restrictions on individual freedom. That's true. Okay, so um, that, that question of what the public good consists of in the second treatise, he defines it as preservation. Okay, so preservation would include um, life and could include health and safety. And then certainly it seems to me that if you looked at um, kind of the, uh, the jurisprudence of the, the 19th century in which when the, when the states are trying to define the, the legitimate uh, scope of the legislative power of government, they're keeping very tightly to uh, very narrow definitions of those things as being legitimate causes for governmental um, legislative restriction on individual rights. Um, so there is a, uh, some opening to a, um, some public concern for life, but it's understood largely um, how do you protect the health of others? Don't assault them. So I think I've been for a long time. Wonder, is there, especially from a Catholic standpoint, is there a problematic aspect to the idea of religious freedom? given the fact that the Catholic Church itself did not accept this until 1963, that is, within my lifetime, and that before that you could find any number of condemnations of religious, of freedom of religion, and even of freedom of conscience. And so, from a Catholic standpoint, is there some Reconciliation that we have to do, is it some rethinking that we have to do, or should we, or we just, should we just forget that history? For an answer, come to the panel on the Declaration on Religious Liberty by the Second Vatican Council on Monday after we get back, December <laughs> 2nd at 4 p.m. <laughs> yes. So the short answer is yes. Is that right? Uh, yes, to, should we should we be worried about it? <laughs> no, yes, that that's something that, yeah, that needs to be considered. In the I think so, yes. Yeah. My, my one quick comment on that is um, several years ago, I, I looked into this, I looked into the topic, at least 19th century condemnation. And the emphasis, the phrasing is meant to be very uh, peculiar and they often in terms of liberty of conscience, separation of church and state. They're not exactly speaking of dictates the conscious language of the founders. Liberty of conscience is often simply the right to choose your own God, the church condemns. Or the separation of church and state and other things is, um, a lot of these things can be distinguished. It would take, but, I, but I'm not prepared to go with the, the details because I don't have them in front of me. Although Rich could have, you, you skipped the next bit from that uh, letter of Pope Leo XIII about what's missing in America, which is established church. Yeah. No, that's no, exactly right. That was, I was sort of, I accidentally made that sort of jumped out at me. That particular, you chose that particular document and sort of so, well, you know, I, had, I was on the clock. Now. <laughs> if you want to give me an hour, I'll say a lot more about it. No, that's exactly right. Now, Leo said, uh, well, he praised America. He said, we not, this should not be understood to be the ideal of the situation. It would be much better if, in fact, the Catholic Church was the established church. Um, you know, but it, again, that, that, that then brings up the sort of prudential question, right? And that is, uh, you, you can say uh, with clarity uh, that, that it, even if one adopted the older view with, with, with a certain degree of clarity that this is the rightful understanding of things, um, what would have happened in America in 1787? You know, with, with Catholics were not the majority, they were not going to, to uh, pass laws saying Catholic Church is the established church in America. Uh, what would have happened? It certainly would have been uh, 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 not uh, uh, helpful to, to Catholics uh, that had that been the case. So, well, I'll qualify that. Um, because I, I do think that in many ways, in some ways, um, the, 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 de, uh, the disestablishment of Protestant religion in America has not necessarily been a healthy thing for Catholicism in America. Right? Uh, that is, the, the support, public support for religion uh, and, and the seriousness of religion uh, is not necessarily a bad thing even for those who are not in the majority. I, I actually, uh, we are, we are going to talk about that for an hour and a half, uh, Monday after Thanksgiving break, so, and, and I hope everybody comes to that. It's going to be a great discussion. But I think 
I can give two quick answers based on, on my talk. Uh, for Augustine, first of all, the 19th century nostalgia for an established church is to some, was to some extent, I believe, based on an un-Augustinian um, lack of awareness of how, things bad, how, how bad things were then, too. But there's, there's no political arrangement that actually simply favors the church. Um, that doesn't, there certainly are better and worse ones, but, but um, it's not as if you have an established church and that just sort of everybody's now a citizen of both cities and everybody's happy. On the other hand, I don't think that in Augustine there is a right to worship according to the dictates of, of your conscience, period. Um, I use the term religious liberty. I think religious liberty is an ambiguous term. It can mean, um, in practical terms, the sort of the truce that I was talking about. That's not, a, that's not a claim that whatever your conscience tells you, you certainly have the right to do. It's just a, it's just a claim about what, uh, what kind of practical accommodation it will ultimately leave both the church and state better off. And that's not quite the same as the kind of principled right that I think, honestly, I think if you, if you go down the road of that principled right, you either end up in the kind of, uh, well, to take it to its consistent conclusion, I think you end up where Locke ends up with it. But that doesn't mean that it can't be, the term can't be used in all sorts of more practical ways the way the founding fathers used it. I just wanted to add, I'm sorry to add one more thing about that, and that is for both, as I mentioned, for both the founding generation, and I think for many who signed the Declaration of Religious Liberty, the idea of religious freedom did not preclude the state from writing a check to a preferred religion, and at least many of the founders did not preclude the laws favoring uh, certain religions by reserving public office to people of certain religions, including Protestants in some places. So the... Uh, Which all get you condemned on Don's list. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a question in, in the back, and then uh, meet down in the front. Okay. Uh, so I'll just start to because we're in this class together, but it's over to the um, in Locke's letter on toleration, he famously precludes atheists from toleration. They, they cannot be. It appears from what we see now a complete reversal, where anyone who's claiming to have these uh, theistic beliefs are actually the ones that are a threat to the modern project of the state. And I'm just wondering, from their perspective, do they have reason to worry about us? Are we truly a problem uh, for the modern state? And if you were in their shoes, how would you deal with it? Sorry, you mean from the atheist perspective? Is that what you're saying? From the, uh, I'll call it non-theist. It's going okay. to be apathetic and not taking a stand on anything, um, not necessarily um, against God. Not a serious believer in atheism. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> it's, they, they call it a war on women for a reason. That religious institutions pose a threat to the means to comfortable self-preservation, as many Americans understand them. That's the problem. If they just, if they would just leave us alone and provide us, and, and you know, comply with these laws, there would be no problem. But it's, it's, they, they can't just put that religion to themselves. Question for Dr. Burns. Uh, you sit back. Uh, if you're Orthodox, you're not going to accept uh, Locke's theological arguments, and also his secondary arguments are unconvincing. Uh, to him, is all I meant to say. He he doesn't think they're convincing. Obviously, you know, the, the, the Council Fathers of Vatican II seem to have thought they were convincing. So I don't mean to get into that argument, but I just meant to say Locke himself thinks that there's good. That Locke doesn't think that uh, an Orthodox person should accept them. But but. Doesn't that mean that an Orthodox person shouldn't accept toleration and should impose their views if they have the power to and might not only for practical reasons like being in the minority or being afraid that you might be in the minority soon? I mean, why would some use Orthodox want religious liberty? Is the question in my view or in Locke's view? Well, I guess I'm assuming that the secondary argument for example, like persecution not being effective is not true, that the truth points out is not true. If, if the way, if what Locke, if Locke does undermine those arguments mm -hmm. and is correct, then someone who's orthodox should at least consider it Orthodox. Mm -hmm. Well, If by consider you mean uh, think about the, the merits and demerits of rather than simply dismiss it as automatically violating a, a, a right of conscience, sure, I think everybody should think about that. I mean, I think in practice, religious persecution works extremely, extremely poorly. Um, and 
I think most sensible religious thinkers have thought about that. That's a little bit different from saying, uh, and really all I meant to say is that for Locke, the, um, the, the Lockean understanding of religious freedom, according to which you have the right to do anything at all you want as long as it's within the restriction, restrictions of um, you know, the dictates of comfortable self-preservation as interpreted by the majority, and you don't have a right to do anything that infringes on those dictates. That understanding, those kind of, of, of limitations, um, according to Locke, it's not intelligent to accept those limitations if you, if you have any kind of orthodox belief, and I think there's something to be said for that. Now that, that opens up the whole point. I mean, that doesn't automatically mean that the Inquisition is a good idea, and I don't think the Inquisition is a good idea. I don't think Augustine thought the Inquisition would have been a good idea either. Um, but it means that you have to think about what exactly does it mean. It, it opens up the possibility that it might be the, the that it might be the role of the government in some circumstances to promote some religions as better than others. And then the question is just, well, which ones are those? How do you promote it? How does that actually work without backfiring on you? Um, in practice, you might, you might very well come to, come to exactly the conclusion. I suspect I, Augustine may very well have come to the same conclusion that the American founders did at the time of the American founding. Um, but you do have to, you have to think it through about in, in terms of practical situations. The argument, for example, that you know you hear today is, well, if you allow the Bible study group to meet after school, then you have to allow the Satan worshippers to meet as well, right? Because after all, we're open all night. That's certainly not the founders' view. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, you got you, you didn't, uh, But the problem, of course, is that once you begin articulating the, the argument as to you know why one should be accepted or the other, uh, and not the other. It, too often, I think, that, that argument becomes a question of uh, practicality, right? that, that, that is, the religion just looks like it's useful, right? and, and, and other religions are less useful. Uh, and so you, you really have to avoid that, I, I, I think. Um, but I don't know if you want to say anything more about that. I mean, one, of the, I mean, one thing that you still, still, still have hanging around is a, a vague or not so vague sense of respect for the American founding. Um, it's, it's still used. It's, it's, it's a, a prominent part of, of, of the rhetoric of political leaders of all parties. And so you can point to the American tradition, which tends to say, uh, American state constitutions, which tend to say you have a right to practice basically anything unless, unless it was proven that what you were doing was violating public health, safety, and morals. And so there was a, there was a um, uh, kind of presumption in favor of religious activity. Uh, to, in fact, often, this is according to Michael McConnell, who I agree with, um, even even to the point of effectively religious exemptions from laws, such as the, the, the penitential exemption um, from um, testifying that an early New York case talked about. We have religious freedom here, and yes, ordinarily, the, the, the law can demand anyone's evidence, but we're not going to make the priest talk, uh, because that's a religious thing. So that, make, making sort of historical slash constitutional argument um, and um, I think that that might that's one way. That's, that's obviously the way I think. I'm, I'm familiar with that, that evidence. I don't know that I entirely agree with the last thing Dr. Doherty said about there being about it being a bad idea to make arguments based on the usefulness of, of religion. Um, maybe we mean different things by it. But 
I think that actually, I mean, I think the greatest living Augustinian is, is Benedict XVI. And um, Augustine in the fourth and fifth century made arguments to the effect that Christianity deserved to be tolerated because it was actually for fulfilling functions that even pagan citizens should recognize as health, politically healthy. That it's, it's preaching virtues better than the pagan temples are. Look at what they're doing in the pagan temples. Look at what we're telling them to do in the Christian churches. These are, these are things that you, our fellow citizens should recognize as valuable contributions, even if you don't accept the truth of it. Um, that's, that's the kind of argument Tocqueville makes in, uh, about American religion and, and uh, democracy in America. And I think that when Benedict uh, talked about religious freedom, it was generally not in, in these terms of, uh, frankly, not in the terms of the Catholic bishops, maybe for, for rhetorical, potential, potential rhetorical reasons, have been using in the, uh, over the HHS mandate, which is just uh, inalienable rights of conscience, inalienable rights of conscience. But when Benedict talks about it, what he, what he talks about is the, the positive contribution that religion can make to a, a democratic and religiously pluralistic society, that there are things religion can do that even, a, even a, just a, a reasonable person uh, who's not a person of faith should be able to recognize that um, are, are, are politically and socially valuable. And for that reason, you're then distinguishing between religions that are socially valuable and, and, and religions that aren't. But Benedict makes the case, and I think Christians should be able to make the case, that even, even, even religions with, that are widely regarded as having somewhat wacky beliefs, like the Catholic beliefs on contraception, still on the whole, really, they're better to have around than not to have around. And that's worth um, giving them a little bit of, of leeway um, on things like the HHS mandate for. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I largely agree, I, but I was, I was laughing, I was thinking about uh, Dr. Kulp's uh, argument was what he, what, what he showed was that in so many of these uh, countries with a large percentage of the po world's population where this, uh, there is re religious oppression, um, that, that there's a parallel, it seems to me, and an increasing uh, 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 religious uh, uh, persecution there's a parallel between that and the fact that uh, virtually every country in the world is declining in population. I don't know what the reason for that connection is, but there is a connection there. But I wanted to add one, one other point, actually, about the, in, on the same point, uh, and that is, you know, when, when Benedict spoke to the, to the German Bundestag in, in 2011, um, it was re really inventive. You know, what he did was he, uh, he addressed the Green Party. And, and his point was... Most of whom had left in protest, and a religious speaker, <laughs> religious speaker in the Bundestag, by the way. Yeah. So for those who might have read the written transcript, um, <laughs> what he said was, uh, he said, you know, look, you, you have an appreciation for the order of nature. Nature has a, has a, a there's something to, and, and his argument was, human nature has an order as well. Okay. And you should recognize that. Uh, and you put it, you put it more clearly than that, and more thoughtfully. But, uh, but that, that I think is a way of going about getting at the same, uh, the same point. Well, uh, I think we're probably done. We have a reception across the hall, right in in Gorman Catholic Church. So please join me in thanking. Oh. I, I was hoping to catch some controversial. Yeah.